think we're ready to go. Meeting of the Tyler ISD Board of Trustees is called to order. There is a presence of a quorum. The meeting has been duly called. The notice has been posted in time. The manner required. We are ready to go. Item number one uh, or three on our agenda is continuous improvement updates, student outcomes. First up, class size update. Now, on page five in your packet um, is our twice a year report to the board um, on where we are on 22 to 1 ratios across the school system. As y'all recall, in June of 17, our District of Innovation Committee um, allowed us to bring towards the board an opportunity at not seeking a waiver from the state anymore, TEA, but just to keep those updates and those uh, actions local. So on page five, you have your, your data for that. Um, 23 number of students that have triggered these over the 22 to 1 ratios in our monolingual classes. We have eight number of students that have triggered over the 22 to 1 ratio in our bilingual classroom. Those, most of those have occurred well after our initial budgeting and our initial staffing. So um, we try to have fidelity to those initiatives. We try to protect the taxpayers' budgets, uh, or the, the taxpayers' funds for our budget, and don't overstaff our school. We're pretty tightly staffed. Yeah. That's doesn't say if this is one teacher or these are several teachers. It just shows it's the grade. amount of students. That's correct. Yeah, we, we, we spread them out. Like four, <laughs> it's two classrooms, like on the filing report. Mm -hmm. Two classrooms at fourth grade, mm -hmm. six total. And so in the in the classrooms is the is the actual classrooms. These numbers That's are right. classrooms in that student. Yeah. So at Griffin, three classrooms in first grade with a total of five students. So, so staying on Griffin, there's there's I mean a distribution of that's possible of. One kid over yeah, in three that classes. That would make a difference if you show. Correct. We yeah. saw it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. no more than two classes could have two kids, I guess, in that distribution. Correct. So, two kids. Yeah. yeah, so there's three third grade classes at Caldwell, three mm -hmm. to fourth grade, but the distribution there is, is amongst those two grade levels. Among six classes, it's a total of eight kids. Yeah. So a couple of classes might have two over. Mm -hmm. Usually it's just one over. Uh, we do a, a allocate teacher aides, half an aide per, per class to support them. Um, and that probably brings us to a conversation later on about how long this 22 to 1 is viable for us um, long term. Because it, it is worth about, I think if you were to increase it 24 to 1, I think it's worth $965,000. But I think there's some non-monetary benefits on that as well. I think as we go through the staffing process and we get to August and we start seeing that we have an increase at a certain school, um, you're going to start dipping into your the bottom of the stack of the resumes to hire some teachers as well for that. Let's say if we needed a fifth teacher, uh, we've done a pretty good job throughout the spring and early summer to find the four that we're going to have there. If we get hit with an enrollment later on, we got to go find that fifth teacher pretty late. So. At a Caldwell, uh, I know that more, if you, uh, used to be you hit a certain level, students didn't get to transfer. So I assume we look at that as well at Caldwell, so that we don't be over in our classes. We, we, it's not just more, it, we, we do a good job of capping schools and grade levels all across the district. We know where we're, we're too big. Um, if, if we're at Owens and we got a second grade and we're already over the 22 to 1, Probably not going to come to, to Owens that year. So that'll be for all of the schools. Even we do it. We do it. District wide. Okay. Yeah. That's district wide. Yeah. yeah. And that's not always comfortable to tell somebody who just bought a house at Christmas in a certain attendance zone. Um, but we we cap it so that we don't tip over anymore because mm -hmm. trying to protect our teachers on that, our budget as well. Um, anyways. Any other questions on this? Okay. Walk through T-tests. 
Yeah, part of the uh, continuous improvement, something we put on the board governance calendar is the reporting of the T-test, walkthrough evaluations, and where we're at. Mr. Sanchez is here to provide that um, <clears throat> report to the board. Uh, this is a not so much the quality of walkthroughs that we have, but the actual walkthroughs that have been conducted up to this point. That's correct. The monitoring of instruction. That's correct. Mr. Sanchez. Good morning, board. Good morning. Chris Hager, superintendent. Appreciate the opportunity to give you a an update. This is merely an update. At the end of the year, we will give you a final report on the number of observations and walkthroughs. So I want to be clear that this is simply walkthroughs. It's every time a teacher, uh, an administrator, has gone into the classroom and has provided some level of feedback to the teacher, which is different with than what the observation is, because with the observation, you do the pre-conference, you do the observation, and you do the post-conference, and then you give them uh, what do they need to do to improve. So that's different than the data that you're gonna get this morning. So I wanna be clear about that. So what T-TEST does is T-TEST tries to ensure that there's a holistic nature of teaching. It means that there is feedback from the student to the teacher and the teacher and the student and that's what they're looking for as they, am I supposed to turn this myself? Is, if you want is that why this is here? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So T-TEST includes goal setting and professional development plan, ongoing walkthroughs, and the evaluation cycle, which is the pre-conference, observation, post-conference. Okay, with the T-TEST rubric, okay, it's broken up into five performance levels. Distinguished, accomplished, proficient, developing, and improvement needed. And there's four areas that principals work with teachers on. There's the planning, there's the instruction, there's the learning environment, and there's the professional practices and responsibilities. Now, the overall data for the walkthroughs, and I want to be mindful that this is the walkthroughs. Up to date, they've had 1,652 walkthroughs have been done with our teachers. And that's an average of 40 through 43 walkthroughs per appraiser. Not per teacher, per appraiser. Has gone into the elementary classrooms, a total of 1,652. At the secondary level. Mr. Sanchez, what's our, so I know roughly total number of teachers, what's our breakdown elementary versus secondary? I think we have around 517, it's either elementary or secondary. We have a total of 20, there's a total of 2,000 staff on our campuses. Say that again. We have a total of 2,000 staff members on campuses. But not, not teachers. Not teachers, that's the entire staff. Okay. Okay, and then at the secondary level, if it's an average of 48 walkthroughs per appraiser. Okay, now be mindful at the elementary level, we have less administrators than we do at secondary, thus the reason why there's a difference in the number of uh, appraisers, appraisals that have been done. And less teachers too. And less teachers. Yeah. Okay? So combined it was 3,232 walkthroughs that were done uh, by our administrators with our teachers. That's this, just walkthroughs. And this is for the purpose of observing instruction. That's correct. Not just checking on how things are going. Like these are walking in, making sure documented. There's a struggle with a student or two, behavior-wise, just right. making an appearance. And so last year, when we when we submitted data, it was how many times did you walk into the classroom, and did you jot it down somewhere? Did you check it off a list? This year, we've asked them to make sure that the walkthroughs that they're doing are meaningful, they're timely, and they're productive. And so they're instead of surface walkthroughs, they're going <coughs> deep. They're going a little bit deeper into looking at um, what kind of engagement is happening between the teacher and the student. So is the, is the walkthrough followed with a talkthrough? That's, I like the way you said that, Mr. <laughs> like uh, Vice President. Yeah, thank you. There's a reason why you're elected there. <laughs> well, yeah, because nobody ever gets So yes, there's always, a, anytime there's a walkthrough, and if it's a praise, they give them a praise. If there's a concern, then they talk to them about the concern. Obviously the concern, you spend more time with a concern than you do the praise, 
Uh, it could be a simple note posted, hey, great job, continue to keep kids engaged. If there's a level of concern, then it's a sit down conversation with them about this is what we saw, uh, this is what we didn't see happening, this is what we need to see happening. And so they make adjustments. It could be as quickly as immediately, like, come here and let me talk to you. It could be after class is over, okay, because there's, at the high school level, if it's first period, there's seven other periods that if we don't correct that behavior, it's going to happen. Okay, so those are the things that we're trying to get our administrators to feel comfortable in doing. Because sometimes they don't feel comfortable calling the teacher to the, to the door and say, these are some of the things we need to correct. And so it's called courage. And so we're trying to get our administrators to have the courage to have a conversation with our teachers about what they need to change and what needs to, how it needs to look different. So are these walk are the data that you collect from the walkthroughs used in any way for their formative evaluations? Yes, ma'am. Right. It's all used. All right. Okay. Now we did have a have an expectation for all of our administrators that they do a minimum of two walkthroughs <coughs> in the first semester and a minimum of four throughout the year for our uh, for the year for every teacher. And walkthroughs could be five minutes. Minutes. It's a minimum of five minutes, so a it needs to it needs to be in depth. It's not the three minute walkthroughs that we some of us knew back in the day. They're they're more in depth. How all services appraisers. All this all this campus all the campus administrators. Not central office. No. We are appraisers. We are certified appraisers. We all have to be, and you all approve that list. We all go through the training. We go through the T-test and the T-test training and are certified. Some of us are certified for a year, and some of us are certified for three years as a result of our last test that so we passed. Those folks doing walkthroughs would be the exception. It's really driven by campus personnel. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And central office administrators can be called in to be another set of eyes mm -hmm. uh, at the request of, of a principal and at the request of a teacher as well. We do that. I won't say frequently, but we are at, we are able to do that. We've probably done a few of those for years since I've been. Have your request on the teacher? A second well, appraisal. The teacher, that's a second appraisal. So the teacher's not that happy with the principal's appraisal. Or maybe even the assistant principal's appraiser after both of them have already done. But they, they didn't be able to deploy somebody to go do that. And we want to make sure that we're clear to our teachers about whether or not you're happy about it is is not what we look at. Is it valid? Do they feel like there was something that was done in error or incorrect? That's the, that's the litmus test that we take a look at when we on a second appraiser. Because you know you might get a low appraiser and say, "Well, I don't like it." Well, you know, kids weren't doing anything and they were jumping all over the place. So another caution on that is asking one of us to come do that appraisal because of one one shot opportunity instead of being able to understand what the total work is. Mm -hmm. It may not be as positive as you're thinking it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's some of that to take in consideration. What Mr. Sanchez is saying as well. That and the officers with you every day may have a much lighter <laughs> uh, concentration of, of what you've been accomplishing. We go in there and it's not good. We're going to call it like it is. <laughs> To try to work with you and coach you through that. Okay, any other questions on this item? Are these kind of random visits or are they made aware of the, right. the, walk, the walkthroughs are random. Mm -hmm. The observations uh, are scheduled ahead of time with the pre-conference. So what happens in the pre-conference is, okay, what should I be seeing? What are you going to be doing? And what can I expect to see as an outcome? So those are more um, scheduled. Than the walkthroughs. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Item C, uh, CTE certification. No, sir. Our goal is three point. Or excuse me. Our goal, the district's goal, three point one, established during the 1670s career, <coughs> focused on these CTE certifications. Mr. Brown's going to give you a mid-year update. The targets are listed in your packet uh, for the progress measure. I appreciate Mr. Brown hustling over here after he introduced Leadership Tyler's group on Education Day at the CT Center. Mr. Brown. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Hager and Dr. Crawford and board members. I appreciate the opportunity. I did just leave Current Technology Center Leadership Tyler 32. It's the facility and I had an opportunity to share a lot of good news about our district uh, there. One of your colleagues actually was involved. That's where the is as well. The, um, the mid-year update, uh, the focus obviously with All-Star Governance Goal 3.1 is on certifications specifically. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk uh, just briefly on that. I will tell you when you look at the goal and, and where we're setting, I mean, we've done this in the past couple of years now, we're, we're in very good shape. I would just begin with that as far as where we are progressing in terms of CT industry-based certifications. It is very heavy in the months of April and May because they're culminating certifications based on the coursework in which the students are enrolled. So I just would mention that as we go through the presentation to keep in mind uh, for this time of the year. The, um, the accountability piece is, uh, and, and this is right now not changed, we know that the legislature is in session and we know there could be some things that can come out of it we're not anticipating. And these are just some bullet points. This is not all inclusive of every single thing that is in domain one. But particularly what we're focused on is on the career ready side of things, that first bullet on the right hand side. Earning industry based certifications from the TEA list. And, and I wanted to talk about that just a little bit before we get into the numbers. The, the list that we have been working from, uh, school districts across the state of Texas, had a list of 30, 30, uh, 73 industry-based certifications on the list. And what they've done, last spring, they had a three-month window where we were allowed to provide input to T Texas Education Agency, to the commissioner, for them to review. And more than 1,300 certifications were submitted from across the state. And, and I can attest for, for Tyler ISD, I think I probably submitted 100 myself, just different things that from teachers and industry that they had suggested as possibilities. They had a very uh, stringent criteria that they were using a rubric to decide which of these certifications will ultimately be included. And then the list that we got, we just got this about a month ago, uh, it's been increased to 211. And that is, a, that's, that's temporary, it takes effect next year, 2019, 2020. So you can see that it's almost tripled. Uh, they just closed the second round of public input this past Tuesday, two days ago, where people had an opportunity to look at that list of 1,300 and say, you know, we, th we really feel strong this one should have been included on your list of 211. So I anticipate that that's going to be pretty constant, but I think that we could see one or two more added to that list. I, I will say one thing, good, ne good news for Tyler ISD is that the ones that we were focused on seeing be added, they were added. Some, some manufacturing, some engineering, some culinary, some things that we wanted to see on there. Uh, the actual numbers of where we are currently, and just a reminder of these different certifications, some of uh, some certifications can fit in more than one category. Uh, the primary uh, one that we're working on and the one that's included in the board goal, uh, Lone Star Governance Goal 3.1, is the second one. It's industry-based certifications that are recognized by the state. That's in the accountability system. And while that number seems very, very low, 16, uh, that's actually about where we were last year. And uh, we've got several certifications, as I mentioned, that are going to take place starting in March, but really get heavy in the month of April and May. So we could see it. I, I would anticipate, based on where we are uh, in, in the curriculum and scope and sequence, that, that those numbers are going to be very equivalent, if not exceeding where they were last year. Which was how many? We had 223 in that second column, I believe, last year. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm anticipating. One so thing what, I would. What's an example of a federal certification? I see Perkins when I think Perkins High Education. I'm used to seeing that name associated with something. Here. Absolutely. And the, and the Perkins, Carl Perkins money is the federal money that flows into the state and the block grant that we do receive to help. It's, uh, it's supportive and supplemental of our CTE programming. Uh, an example would be OSHA certification. Occupational okay. Safety okay. Health okay. Administration okay. certification, right. FEMA Federal Emergency okay. Management okay. Administration. Okay. So there's several of those type that we, uh, and Dr. Crawford has mentioned this before. We we by no means are focused in on something purely for accountability. Mm -hmm. We're trying to provide things that are best for students and what our community tells us they need to see. So that's why these other numbers we're, we're adding them. We're not going to exclude anything we feel like is, is important. That OSHA one. Um, I have a niece that graduated and right out of uh, college makes over a six-figure salary because she went through all of that and it only did it with OSHA. The, the, the OSHA these great building sites and so that, that's you ever have a chance and you want someone to come and talk to the students if I could get her down here she sure would be good to encourage them because uh, that girl has a nice job. Share, share the information we always are looking to put industry people in front of our students 
And OSHA certainly one. I will tell you, just I used OSHA as an example. It is one that has been on the Perkins list. It's inclusive in these numbers. That when you look on the list, that I hope that you have a hard copy of the, of the list. It's actually going to be on the new list. The so new that's an example on the new state list. list. Well, it's going to be the OSHA 30 hour. Right. Okay. Uh, not, not the, there, there's an introductory OSHA that's just right. kind of a safety training, but the full 30 hour that you're talking about, that, that one is going to be on. Yeah. So that's an example of some, the state listening. They're listening and, and they're being responsive to that. Uh, the, and, and actually those students, the construction science students that you see in the photograph, that's, that actually is an OSHA certification that they're holding up right there from this year that's on that Perkins list. Uh, I just included a few just so you could see. It's always better to see the student faces than it is just to see numbers on the page. But veterinary medicine students, these are from this year uh, that have received those certifications. I'm extremely proud. I'm going to highlight this. We're proud of all of them, but that diesel mechanics you see up there, this is brand new. This is the first year we, we offered that. Uh, we opened this up to students in the course selection process in the spring of 2018. Uh, yes, spring, last spring. And we had 11 students, which was enough to kind of pull together a group. And we have Willie Bryan, who works in our transportation department, actually is teaching and working with these students. So he, he's working on both sides there with both the transportation department and as a teacher. And the, there are four students in this photograph, two more since have passed the so six of the 11, have now achieved this, uh, it's, a, it's American Society of Engineers heavy and medium diesel engine mechanic certification. It is a high level certification that gives them employability immediately. And so six of the 11 are, have passed, two more are taking it at the end of February. His goal, and I think we're gonna get there, is all 11 of them by the end of the year are gonna have those certifications, so. And then- yeah, uh, I'll just tell him they'll always have a job. <laughs> absolutely. Some of them hopefully will tolerate day. I know we're looking for mechanics. The engineering students, I believe those are the FEMA certifications they're, they're, uh, they're holding up. Some of those are in engineering, and there are a few of those from the firefighting program there that as well. I, I just put these last couple slides in because it is a mid-year update, and this all ties together. Certifications, instruction, what's happening. Uh, we held a Pathways Profession event at each of the campuses at John Tyler, Robert E. Lee, and Current Technology mm -hmm. Center. And so the, these industry professionals, that, that bottom left-hand corner, that, that's a Professor Matson from TJC in the culinary department that came out to speak with our students, and he focused very much on career pathways and, and credentialing that needs to take place. Uh, that bottom middle is the UT Tyler Pharmacology professor and graduate assistant speaking to our students on ph uh, pharmacology. Uh, that bottom right-hand is Fitzpatrick Architecture, speaking to some of our architecture students uh, on that day when they were at Robert E. Lee. And then that top one is UT Health, uh, Northeast, that's Dr. Kent Willis speaking to some of our health science students uh, for this event. And I, ju I just wanted to, to bring this in and really go down to that bottom number because the technical dual credit that we're able to offer, th these coincide often with the certifications. So students are getting college credit that could ultimately lead to, we've talked before about that, that 60 by 30 Texas. They would have to go to get the associate's degree for to count into that list. But our certifications and our technical dual credit are leading students in the direction of those advanced degrees. So I just wanted to mention that, and that, that's up a little bit. And the board needs to know we are a we are very ready, fire, aim about that. In other words, we want to go. Yes. But higher ed, they want to sit there and synthesize everything that's been said, tug on the pipe a little bit, rub their elbow. See, those are people who've always been in higher ed. Yeah. Been in so, but they, but they, they, say, the right, they say the right things about technical dual credit. But we're trying to, mm -hmm. we want to go now. And we think that that is a very viable um, way to get to that 60 by 30. The other issue, you know, just, this kind of dovetails off of that, is I think we're about to commission a study, TJC, UG Tyler, and Tyler ISD, to get a true indication about where we are for 60 by 30 because we really don't get that information until census data comes out. We all know when the census is coming. We're a year away. We won't get the final results until a year after that. And so we want to, we want to know where we're at right now and, and seeing if we have made a difference with some of these certifications that we've injected into the system, the associate degrees that everyone's getting now since JUCO is actually, or community college has been a very viable thing to do. Because right now we're not going to make six, Smith County is not going to make the, the 60 by 30 mark. We, we just don't know where we're at, and we would like to get that data so that we can do some things like this and speed some things up. So, 
Must have Mr. Brown does a good job of trying to make that happen. We just need to make it happen. Well, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, yeah, we've got, we're full steam ahead on all these little credit things. Uh, several examples uh, of students are HITT 1305, which is the medical terminology course in our Associates of RN program at Tyler Junior College. We've got sophomore and junior students that are, that are receiving dual credit in that program. So that, that will apply towards that the associates of nursing degree in other areas, anatomy and physiology and several. So yeah, we're not we're not we're not going to be held back. We're moving forward. The uh, I, I just um, I wanted to put this up. This is the time of year once again being an update talking about certifications and CTE students eighth through eleventh. This will be next year's high school students across the district are selecting courses for next year. So we've been out. We've been sharing information. We've produced this 1920 uh, pathway guide that lists all of our different career pathways. And hopefully, did, did you, I know in your packet, did you get a, if you got a little, we've moved to this. Our graphic students, our with the current technology student, developed this. They actually put together the pathway guide with the cover and everything. But it's QR code. If you uh, scan it, and, and I passed this out to leadership title this morning. A lot more cost effective than than this, than this than, you know trying to print 2,000 of these books. So and plus, this is easier. You can do it on your phone. But this goes to the CTC website. And then this book, this pathway guide is linked right off of the website if you want to see the different courses we're offering. That's taking place right now. And then just a final mention that February is CTE. I hope it works. It'd be bad if it didn't work. I uh, mean, try, uh, try it out. It, it did this morning. And uh, the CTE, the pathway guide's on the left. Is it coming up? No, it sent you to some place else. Uh -oh. Ooh, it did not work. It worked this morning. <laughs> Public record search. Uh oh. Well, it, it worked this morning. So. Okay. The, the, well, here, here's one thing I would say about just this entire process of course selection. The students are telling us what they want to do now, uh, as far as for next year. But, but the one thing that can change, we know, is that when the legislature finishes and they come back with new information, certification list is updated. We'll go back, and the public will need to see parents and students and teachers. Here's some new opportunities. Maybe here's some opportunities that are going to match more with career pathways. So that's a kind of a static. And then I just, with, with February being a Career and Technology Education Month, just wanted to, to highlight some of these things. I appreciate the communications department working with us and trying to promote these events. But just, just a few students and slides and programs that we want to make sure we get out in front of the public and let them know what's happening. And then and just finally, these last few events. Uh, it is National CTE Month. Uh, we have coming up uh, next week, next Wednesday, uh, the second round of UT Health pre-health uh, pre conference out of UT Health Northeast. And our students did so well in the fall event, they invited our students specifically from Tyler ISD to come back and host the spring event. So the 25 students that participated in the fall are now going to go back and be hosts to show the students from not only our district, but other districts around the facility and, and kind of help lead that. The Opportunity Fair, actually got a couple volunteers this morning with the Leadership Tyler Group on April 25th. That is where we have local industry businesses, any area from marketing, finance, industry, to come in and share information with our students. Everything from resume building to interview skills, soft skills, and that was a very successful event last year, so we're looking forward to it. And um, you know, just a few events I wanted to list there, and that's all the information I have at this time. I to fill some questions. Any questions? Mr. Brown? Hey, you're thinking of your question for Mr. Mayor Brown for be aware that the 86th legislature is in session. Yes. Uh, there's some early things floated out there as part of the school finance bill mm -hmm. in regard to the weights of CTE funding. Um, and it also goes all the way down to sixth grade. So um, there might be some opportunities there for us to do some cool things for kids mm -hmm. to help us get them prepared for the workforce and to help our campaign. Mm -hmm. That is something in the back of my to do what it's for. So whatever you can do, uh, encouraging your local rep and senator to include some of that funding would, would certainly be appreciated. <coughs> this is a great example of a, of a or a bad example negative that there is this gap. There's a gap that still exists between the perception of many in our community about what this initiative does and how radically different it is from what we did in career education 30, 40 years ago, where when you hear CTC, you explain it to people, they're like, oh yeah, 
wood shop and metal shop, and you're like, no, we're talking hundreds of career pathways to, and you start rattling off engineering, pharmacy, vet, I mean, high tech things that are great professions for kids to pursue. It's, it's, this is something that's leading the state in terms of how far along we are in this effort. So I appreciate all you're doing to, to educate our community about it, but it's just one of those things that I still scratch my head sometimes when I talk to people and they, they're stuck in what was happening 50 years ago and not how kind of earth shattering this is for our community. Approximately half, I'll just give you an example of the leadership Tyler group had not been in the Current Technology Center and were really not very familiar with the programming at the Current Technology Center. So as they toured the building, I mean, you could see the light bulbs coming on and you're like, oh, this is what's going on in here. So you're absolutely correct. We've got to keep that communication piece out. Yeah, sometimes when I my, tell somebody about it initially, they, they might say, yeah, college in for everybody. And, you know, and I know that's part of it, but that's like 10% of it, man. No, got it. This is like, this would have put me so far ahead of the curve in my degree mm -hmm. at Baylor. Mm -hmm. You know, they're Absolutely. using industry grade uh, stuff and, and everything they do. Right. So it's put them ahead of the game when they go to college. It is. Or when they go to a career. Multiple entry and exit points, that's always a goal that we have for our kids. Any other questions or comments on this item? Thank you, Mr. Brown. We have two uh, action items. We need to do these separately. We need to do them explicitly, or can we do them together? I'm looking at the lawyers or team that do one of you. Can we do them together? I don't have a problem doing it together. Okay. Um, you want to explain these two awesome action items? Yes, um, every year um, this board of trustees, uh, for our the way we uh, conduct elections, uh, needs to have a calling of a general election, and then later on a canceling. But that's not the case. We've actually had some folks file for an election this year, so we will be calling an election, a general election for the school board trustee for single member districts one, three, and six. And then we also have interlocal agreements between Smith County, the City of Tyler, Tyler ISD, and White House ISD that gets us going on all the great workings and inner workings between the different jurisdictions as far as conducting those elections, whether it be paying for voting machines, identifying locations for where people can go vote, among the other activities that Gina is involved in. <clears throat> There's my image. Any uh, questions or discussion on this item? I'm sure this is some agreement that came about many, many moons ago, but uh, is there a reason we don't have our election during the major election time in Logan? Or is this something that Usually that's a charter um, issue in regard to um, how your school system was originally chartered, <clears throat> how the county was chartered, yeah, even years ago, yeah. um, uh, along with the city charter. It all kind of comes into play there. Uh, if you take for instance in McLennan County, I have experience with that. We, the, the way that the school, the sub school systems there, their charter written, they had to go to the county win. Um, but that's, I, I'm not sure if that's what's in our charter or not, but it always goes back to what your charter looks like on how you're to conduct those elections. Now, guess what supersedes those charters? Yeah. State law. Yeah. If state law were to decide to go to a certain time, and that time only, your charter no longer really matters. The only real choice that we had as a district was a few years ago when there was uh, talk about how long you would elect three, a trustee. Four three or four years, we stood, we stayed with the three. The ones that are in the four years are generally at the November general election. And that oh, was, is that right? Well, you that, tell us that. Generally, not. Yeah, the generality is, is the, the school system that I was referring to before was still stuck with three year terms, but they had to go to the November election because mm -hmm. of what they're charged. Right. Seems like that would save money. Well, the other, the other piece to that is. Um, you know, the city goes at the same time. We're required to do a joint, to hold a joint election. Um, and so the city has their charter set up that they go in May as well. So when he's talking about, there was some discussion about whether they were changing 
and the city was opting not to, to change all their charter information as well. So that's kind of where we've, we've landed. To, and, and of course, like this year, TJC is not, does not have election. They do it on um, even number of years. And so next year in May, TJC will jump back in um, and be part of the interlocal agreement. I do think your point is valid, Reverend Mason. Um, to, City, county, state, everybody goes to, to, to an extent. <laughs> um, I don't know how vital, not vital, I don't know how much of a cost savings it is for us, really. Okay. And when you start talking about smaller jurisdictions, there's no doubt that the cost of the election does mount up for a, a 2A school system versus a, maybe a city that only has a res, residence of 500 people that have a very large tax base. Mm -hmm. Same thing with smaller counties. When you get into the larger uh, school systems and school and, and cities and counties, I think that you're gonna you're you're gonna pay in May and you're gonna pay in November. And there's gonna be some efficiencies in there. But but I think that that's something that, that can be considered later on. I'll give a shout out to Gina Board because she has very patiently taken taken a number of courses in Austin that are hard to sit through on the election. Uh, rules and, and guidelines and when you start looking at what the cost is for the voting machines the locations you know, we, we allow our schools to be voting centers and things but it, it is a um, an ordeal to set up an election one last thing before we'll be in the legislative session before we call for a motion there is a bill that has been filed that says that if you are are a school system and you use one of your facilities to hold an election, you are to let the kids out that day. And that, that day is supposed to be a professional development day for your staff. So that's an unfunded mandate. I mean, it really is. So um, I believe the individual that has filed that bill is from Rockwall. And I'm sure that Rockwall, with their 10 or 15 percent economic disadvantage rate, can find a place for those 10 or 15 percent kids when you're 70 percent plus what do you need to keep there? So. has there there typically has been recently bills filed requiring the school districts to move to the November elections do you know if one has been filed for that I do not know if it's been filed yet I, I just see Mr. Landis on that he's been the guy's warehouse he would have learned me of that there that is there is some rhetoric out there about that um, not just from some of your typical folks like the Jonathan Sticklins and whatnot. Uh, that's actually being talked about as part of the, 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 property, tax. the property tax reform. We're, we're in the majority of the fact that schools go in May. Um, yeah. When you sit down and go to the conference, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll ask who, who goes in May and who goes in November. And yeah. We're still with the majority. Um, a lot of school districts are in high school. Hey, any other questions or comments on this? Mr. Chairman, I move the order for a calling of your own election on Saturday, May the 24th. For single member districts, one, three, and six, regretfully. So not May 24th. That was May 4th. Where did I say? So it's down here is May 5th, but the election's May 4th, uh, right? May 4th. May 4th. I say May 4th. You can tell my opponent that it's May 5th, but for everybody else, May 4th. And the approval of the interlocal Okay, do I have a second for a second. Thank you. Second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Um, we now go to executive session.